Hey there, students. So welcome to part three of the AP Calculus AB um, multiple choice uh, review questions for 1998. In this installment, we're going to be going over questions uh, 11 through 15. So let's go ahead and take a look at question number 11. So uh, for question 11, we're told that if f is a linear function and 0 is less than a and a is less than b, then uh, the integral from a to b of the second derivative of f of x dx equals what? So um, we are going to find, we're supposed to find the value of this uh, definite integral right here. But we know that f is a linear function. So if f is a linear function, what does that tell us? Uh, well, if it's a linear function, we can write down the general form for all the linear functions. So you can see f of x is of the form ax plus b. Okay, every linear function can be written like this. Now, what does the second derivative look like? Well, the first derivative, f prime of x, is going to be a, using the power rule. It tells us that for all linear functions, the first derivative is a constant. Now, what does that tell us about the second derivative? The second derivative of a constant is simply 0. Okay, so f double prime is 0. So with this information, we can find out what the value of that integral is. So the integral from a to b of f double prime of x dx is simply the integral from a to b of 0, since the second derivative is uh, 0, 0 dx. Okay? All right, so if we apply the power rule here, um, the antiderivative of 0 is basically 0x, zero 0x uh, zero to the 1 over, over 1, evaluated from a to b. Because imagine that there is, since there's no variable, there's like an uh, x to the 0 power there, because you know x to the 0 is 1, right? So uh, we can always, if there's a constant, you can always insert x to the 0. And then when we apply the power rule to that, we'll have um, x to the 1 over 1, okay? Power rule for antiderivatives. All right, now um, if we simplify this integral, uh, this value that we just integrated, the antiderivative, it's going to be 0. 0 evaluated from a to b is simply 0. Okay? Now, to give you an area representation of this uh, integral right here, let's just make a sketch of the situation. So let's say we have a graph, and we are integrating from a to b. Remember, the integral is like an, the area on the curve, right? So we are finding the area under the curve from a to b. So this is the width of the rectangle, but the function f of x equals 0 is what we are integrating. So what does that look like? The, the graph of f of x equals 0 falls on the x-axis, so it's right here. So this is the y of, this is the x-axis, and it's also the function um, f of x equals 0, all right? So what is the area here? We're looking for the area here. Well, we know that for this rectangular region, let me make the line a little bit thicker so you can see oh, what I'm talking about. So what's the area here? Okay, of this rectangle right here. Uh, so to find the area, we know the area is uh, the width and the height. In this case, the width is um, a minus b, right? So the width equals, actually b minus a is the width. What is the height of this rectangle right here? Uh, well, since it's right on the uh, x-axis, it has zero height, so the height is basically zero. So you can see that the integral from a to b of this function, zero dx, is simply uh, zero, the height times b minus a, which is simply zero, which is what we got before. So you're taking the rectangle, the area of a rectangle with, with b minus a and the height is basically zero because the function, this function right here, is f of x equals 0. All right, so the answer is clearly option letter A. Okay, let's move on to uh, number 12. <coughs> number 12, we have to find the limit of a piecewise defined function. So uh, for number 12, we have f of x equals the natural logarithm of x if x is between uh, 0 and 2, with 2 included. And then it's x squared times the natural logarithm of x if x is between 2 and 4, with 4 included. Okay? 
All right, so to give us a good visual, I like to, I like to express uh, piecewise defined functions in a number line, okay? So we have a number line like this. We're going from, uh, we're going from zero all the way to four. The partition starts somewhere in the center, okay? Which is two. To the left side of two, we have the function, um, the natural logarithm of x. And then to the right side, between 2 and 4, we have x squared times the natural logarithm of x, okay? So when you're approaching 2 in this direction, that is basically the limit as x approaches 2 from the left side, okay? And when you're approaching 2 from this direction, this is that's the limit as x approaches 2 from the right side, okay? All right, so... If these two limits are the same, the value that those both limits approach will be the value of the limit. But if they're different, then the limit does not exist. Remember that this limit is a double-sided limit since it doesn't have any sign, okay? So let's go ahead and evaluate the limits individually and then see if they're actually the same. So let's compute the left-hand limit first. Limit as x approaches 2 from the left. For this one, we're going to be looking at the function ln of x, okay? Natural logarithm of x. All right, so if we plug in 2 here, this is simply going to be the natural logarithm, oh, sorry, the natural logarithm of 2. All right, this is the value of the left-hand limit. This is what the function approaches as x approaches 2 from the left. And then the right-hand limit, limit as x approaches 2 from the right. Well, what function are we looking at here? We're going to be looking at this function because we're going from the right. So we're going to be looking at x squared times the natural logarithm of x. If you just plug in 2, it's going to be 2 squared times the natural logarithm of 2. You get this by substituting 2 into this x and that x. Simplify a little bit further. 2 squared is 4 times the natural logarithm of 2. And then we can use the power rule for exponents. Power this up. This becomes the natural logarithm of 2 to the 4th. 2 to the 4th is uh, 4 times 4, which is 16. Natural logarithm of 16. Okay? So what does that tell us? Well, the left-hand limit is natural logarithm of 2, and that is absolutely not equal to the right-hand limit, which is um, the natural logarithm of 16. Okay? So since the limit as x approaches uh, 2 from the left, the left-hand limit is not equal to the limit, um, let's put that f here, of f of x, is not equal to the limit as x approaches 2 from the right of the function since the left and right hand limits are different. That implies that the limit, the double sided limit as x approaches 2 of f of x, does not exist. Okay? Or is non existent. So the answer is option E. Option letter E. Okay, let's move on to number 13. So for question 13. Um, it says the graph of a function is shown uh, in the figure above uh, has a vertical tangent at 2, 0 and horizontal tangents at 1, negative 1 and 3, 1. For what values of x from negative 2 all the way to 4 is f not differentiable? So this we can use this opportunity to go over when uh, the derivative is, is non-existent or where the differentiation fails. Okay, so our conditions for non-differentiability are when f is not differentiable. Okay, so when is f not differentiable? Differentiable. Um, well, f is not differentiable when you have a corner, just like an absolute value function. Where the corner is, the function is not differentiable because the left and the right hand derivatives are different. If you have a cusp, something like this, it kind of looks like a vertical tangent from the left and the right hand. Um, if you have a corner cusp, if you have a vertical tangent, vertical tangent, that happens like this. See this case right here, we have a vertical tangent or a function looking like this. So at that point where you have a vertical tangent, the function is not differentiable. 
And then also, uh, when you have, whenever you have a, so let's not number them, one corner, two cross, three vertical tangent, four is discontinuity of any kind. Okay, if you have any kind of discontinuity, point or infinite, is non-differentiable. Uh, okay, so you have something like this. Okay, this is a point discontinuity, weird looking function, or you have a, or you have an asymptote, something looking like this, oops, no, let's try again, or if you have a function that has an asymptote, let's draw that, so you have an asymptote like this, okay? So if you have any kind of discontinuity, removable or infinite, uh, the function is not differentiable um, on that, at that point where the discontinuity is, okay? All right, so let's look at this case. When is the function not differentiable? We have a discontinuity at x equals zero. So at x equals zero, where else? And then we have a vertical tangent at x equals two. So those are the only things that violate uh, the rules for differentiability, the conditions for differentiability. Everything else is fine. We don't have any corner costs uh, anywhere else, so discontinuities or vertical tangents anywhere else other than zero and two. At zero, we have a discontinuity, and at two, we have a vertical tangent. All right. Okay. So uh, remember, we are not four. Four is not included um, in the in the domain, or else we have a vertical tangent here also. But four is not included, so that's why we're not going to include four. So our answer is simply going to be zero and two only. So our answer is option letter B. All right, let's move on to 14. Question 14 um, it says a particle moves along the x-axis so that the position at any time t is given by x of t equals t squared minus 60 plus 5. Forward value of t is the velocity of the particle zero. So how do you get the velocity from the position function? You just simply differentiate the position function to get the velocity function, right? So let's write down the position function first, t squared minus 60 plus 5. The velocity is simply going to be uh, x prime of t, or, the, oops, no, or dx dt, okay? So x prime of t uh, is going to be 2t minus 6. All right, so the question asks when the velocity of zero is equal to zero. So we're just going to set the expression for the velocity to zero and solve, okay? If we add six to both sides and divide by two, we have t equals three. Uh, so t equals three seconds is the time when the velocity uh, equals zero. So the answer is option letter C. All right, let's move on to question 15. Question 15, um, we're given the function and we have to find f prime of two. This function is your typical uh, representation of FTC part one. So let's write out what FTC part one is. Just a real quick refresher. FTC part one, if we have f of x uh, equals the integral from a to x of f of t dt, then f prime of x is simply f of x, okay? So that goes FTC part one. So uh, we can clearly see that just by simply inputting two into this function, that will give us what? Into the integrand, that will give us what uh, the value of this of f prime of two is. So, but let me just apply the um, FTC part one explicitly here. So we have the function f of x, or this problem as being the integral from 0 to x of the square root of t to the third plus 1 dt. So by FTC part 1, the f prime of x is what you get when you plug in x for the variable. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this t and I'm going to plug it in for x. I mean, I'm going to take x and plug it in for t in the, in the, in the function, okay? Of the integrand. So if I do that, I plug that in, I'm going to have the square root of x to the third plus 1. Okay, remember f of t is the square root of t to the third plus 1, so f of x will be what you get when you replace your t with x. Well, the question asks us to do something more. We have to find the 
f prime of 2 okay so to do that we're going to just simply plug in 2 into this uh, expression right here so we have the square root of 2 to the third plus 1 which is the square root of 8 plus 1 which is the square root of 9 and the square root of 9 is 3 all right so uh, there goes your final answer which is option letter D so there you have it